Good morning, everyone. Good morning, sir. So today, so today is the thirty-first day of October, twenty twenty-three, and we will be looking at the legal regime for host communities. Legal regime for host communities. Or legal regime for host community development. You can look up. In previous classes, we have tried to look at the legal framework for ownership of oil and gas resources. We emphasize the fact that apart from the United States of America and perhaps a few states in uh, Canada, the norm is that all over the globe, all over the world, petroleum is centrally owned, centrally managed, and uh, what states provide for is derivation. And so the region from whence the petroleum is extracted would usually be entitled to something over and above what the rest of the regions in that particular country would be entitled to. That is for federal systems. In, uh, uh, uni, in unitary systems, like in the United Kingdom and Norway, where they don't have a federation, but they have a unitary system, there is even no provision for uh, derivation. Rather, the region from Enzo's petroleum, where the petroleum is extracted, will stand to benefit more in terms of contracting, in terms of housing, because they own the land and uh, engagement. So for example, uh, Aberdeen, Aberdeen in the United Kingdom, somewhere in Scotland, is the hub for the oil and gas industry in that country. And even though the United Kingdom doesn't provide for derivation, Aberdeen still stands to benefit uh, reasonably when you compare it with other regions of that country. But for most federal systems, what you see is derivation. And moving on from there, we try to emphasize that the, for the Niger Delta, for Nigeria, the 1960 Constitution and the 63 Constitution had provided a revenue sharing formula based on uh, principles such as needs, land mass, and uh, population, and then derivation. And for derivation, we emphasize the fact that 50% was provided for for the regions in you know, petroleum, not just petroleum, but mineral resources, natural resources extracted from the environment. 50% was to be sent back to those regions, and then 20% was to be paid to the federal government, and 30% was to be shared among all the states, including those uh, the region, not states in this case, including the eastern region from whence or any region from where the petroleum or the mineral resources had already been extracted. So in addition to the 50% you get for being the owner of the natural resources, you still have the entitlement to share in the other 30% as well. And we also emphasize that there was no offshore, onshore dichotomy, which was a very, very uh, uh, agreeable understanding. But that in 1966 there was a military coup that uh, overthrew the civilian administration and then the military began to rule by decree, and among other things, they suspended parts of the 1963 constitution, one of which was section 140, which had provided for uh, derivation. Going on from there, we also looked at the progressive deprivation of the Niger Delta region through the issuance of decrees, one of which was the 1974, 1971 onshore and offshore uh, and, and decree, essentially, which offshore oil revenues decree or so of 1971, which essentially stood to uh, uh, create an onshore, offshore dichotomy, the essence of which was that all petroleum derived offshore was sent straight to uh, Lagos, now it's Abuja, rather than to the region. So the region did not have the right to you know, benefit from any form of derivation because it was deemed that petroleum offshore was not uh, part of those uh, littoral regions and then we looked at the incremental reduction of derivation we looked at the incremental and uh, uh, deprivation of the niger delta region by the reduction of derivation 
and we emphasize that the 1979 constitution did not even provide for derivation, we know. And then we pointed out that in 1992, there were some attempts to increase derivation to 3% and to abolish the onshore, offshore dichotomy as well. But when we returned to civilian rule in 1999, uh, there was no mention of onshore, offshore dichotomy. Rather, Section 162 of that uh, constitution provided for some form of derivation, minimum of which uh, is what percentage, sir? 13%. Excellent, 13%. And then uh, that is attendance. That has been uh, the situation, and at the time there was some uh, disagreement. The federal government took the states to court 2001, and then the Supreme Court upheld the contention of the federal government that indeed there was no onshore, offshore, I mean indeed there was an offshore, onshore dichotomy which according to them was valid and um, based on common law and international law. We also pointed out that the outcome of that decision was to disentitle the Niger Delta state from participating in every petroleum that is extracted offshore and uh, particularly it was Cross River State whose, uh, whose petroleum Okay, I hope you signed just one. Yes. Okay. It's, it's, really not it's okay. It's okay. So we pointed out that uh, that was the position. So Cross River was particularly hit because most of this petroleum, uh, so called, have been located uh, offshore. And so to perhaps assuage their concern, in 2004, there was an onshore, offshore dichotomy act, which uh, tried to you know, provide some compensation, but that it was not extensive enough to completely abolish that uh, dichotomy. So I'm doing this by way of background. I love giving background in order to be able to move on to where we are. Uh, so since then, the federal government of Nigeria now the host communities, or what, let me not say the host communities, the Niger Delta region in general has had issues. Okay, any issue, please, let me focus on my class. I'm a bit distracted. Have you, have you signed? Okay, okay. So the Niger Delta region uh, had this, we've had these issues for long, and uh, feelings of deprivation, feelings of marginalization, uh, perceived or real have been there for so many uh, decades now. The region suffers from environmental degradation, which we are all uh, aware of, uh, extreme poverty, depletion of the land and the fishing resources of the people by the continuous petroleum uh, 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 you know, extraction by oil companies, and then there's also violence, violence meted out to the people when they try to assert themselves, sometimes in a, even through peaceful means. The classic example was the uh, uh, hanging of Ken Rua on uh, the 10th of November 1995 with some modern environmentalists and uh, agitators in Ogoni land were brutally hanged by the uh, federal military government of that era. You know, so when Nigeria eventually returned to civilian rule in 1999, at least there was some space for people to contend again and to clamor for some form of uh, resource control. Thus far, uh, uh, to, assuage, to assuage the uh, concerns of the people, certain initiatives have been put forward, one of which is the establishment of the NDDC. The sad thing is that uh, <laughs> NDDC is, is manned by Niger Deltans. So if this establishment was set up to address our problem, then we should have been able to reap the benefit, but we all know that it has become the hub for corruption. Uh, it's, it is, of course, the hub for corruption. So the, the truth is that even if you give Niger Delta people one, give the hundred percent, we'll still be poor because it's a spiritual, it's a, it's a mindset problem, it's a corrupt uh, problem. So we set up this NDDC, and then huge sums of uh, funds were given to them, as is often the case. In, political elites hijack the entity and then use it as a system of patronage. So NDDC becomes a system of political patronage, bogus contracts, and uh, all that. It was that it was so bad that uh, 
around 2005-2006, there was a chairman of NDC then, I've forgotten his name, a, young, a man from Akwaibom. He had a problem, he was the chairman, and he had a problem with the managing director then, uh, Timmy Alaibe, and he wanted to kill him. So he got somebody to invoke <laughs> some causes. And uh, among the terms of the engagement was that he was to burn, you heard of that story, you have all forgotten. He was to burn 300 million naira, so he took 300 million naira to a cemetery, he was to burn it naked, and then after everything he did, the man that he wanted to kill did not die, the man was waxing stronger, and then he went after the native doctor, the native doctor incidentally is an German from Delta State. It was all in the news. Mm -hmm. Yes, we went after that man, and that was how the thing got blown up. That was around 2007. So yeah, I do have to suspend him and all that. So despite the fact that we had the NDDC, we did not see any meaningful uh, results. Again, we, we had 13%, like I pointed out last time. And what the Niger Delta states have received from 1999 till now runs into billions of dollars. Nothing again to show for it, nothing significant. We have the Home State and the River State can point out, point to one or two infrastructural and, and leaps or achievements, but largely speaking, the Niger Delta states remain very poor. Classic model is by Elsa State. <laughs> Delta states. And uh, most of the region is extremely poor and all that. So NDC failed. Then there was the issue of uh, the 13% derivation has also failed. Then they set up the Niger Delta Ministry. That entity doesn't have so much funding. But again, we have not seen any serious uh, results. So that is where we are. But today our focus is with respect to the community. So you have to draw, when we look at the Niger Delta question, you have to draw two distinctions. First of all, the oil-bearing communities and then the oil-bearing states. You know, the oil-bearing communities reasonably or naturally ought to benefit more because the petroleum is extracted directly from their state where get out of why are you coming now? Oh, sorry sir, I went to see Mr. Sir. Sorry, sir. You are Mr. Sorry, so you have a class and you're going to see somebody. No 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 I didn't know you were here sir. I was sitting outside. Enter, know. enter. Now your age and just the look that you are a very young girl so I'm just accommodating you. I believe that by the time we get to year five, we would have grown. Let's continue. So the, now the issue is communities. For this for the states, the federal government has at least tried to see we have increased derivation from three percent in 1992 to uh, 13. Nothing to show for it. But more importantly, what about the, the, the regions, the states? I mean, the communities in these states where the petroleum is taken from, they suffer more, you know, from pollution, gas flaring. So I may come from a community that doesn't have oil in Bielsa. I will not suffer so much of the environmental degradation and the erosion of my land, destruction of my, my, my creeks, swamps, all those uh, economic crops and all that. I won't suffer. You know, but you are suffering. But the money that is brought to the state is managed centrally by the state governor. And he may, particularly in these days of political vindictiveness, if that particular region where the oil is extracted from is not in his political party or did not support him, he can stop them of uh, the benefits of even the 13% for the next uh, eight years. Are you with me so far? Yes. So there has been this clamor that there should be some form of decentralization of the benefits accruing from petroleum revenues to the host communities. The 1960 constitution did not envisage that because the idea was that governors were going to be just. And 63 did not. All the initiatives that were put forward up to 1999 did not. But when the PIB of 20, 2004 was now being drawn, we now began to hear about host communities. They started agitating for a direct form of compensation. And so in 2012, the PIB 2012, for the first time now provided that oil companies were to give 10% of their annual spend in the previous year to the community from whence they operate in particular. Of course, the oil companies resisted that. 
And that law was not enacted until we now have the PIA 2021. I said all of that to give you what background, because we want to jump in. Before the enactment of this PIA, the oil companies, in, in, in line with what we call corporate social responsibility, began to enter into certain agreements with those communities. Not all of them, but a number of them. What is it called, sir? GM. Excellent. Global Excellent. So they began to enter into these communities, into this agreement with communities. They will put a few communities into a cluster. Is that so? Yes, sir. Have you been involved in it? Yes, sir. In any way? Yes, sir. Please come and share your experience with us. Come forward. Let the video capture you. This is Mr. Abaka. Abaka what? Abaka. Abaka what, sir? Abaka Wizide. Okay, Abaka Wizide. It's an German. From which community? Okay, it's a two stand there now because your face will be going to YouTube. Okay, over to you. Explain, give us your experience. What was it about? The, from my being here, basically, from my area, it started 20, 2005, when uh, the Tunata was the governor of the state. A bit louder. Tunata was the governor of the state. Yes. The chairman, who are the operators of uh, Penity, Agbami, and Bunga, Fig, yes. then clustered the eight communities. Number one, number two, Christian Sagana, is it one, is it two? A Kimi and Fropa, eight communities as cluster community. Mm -hmm. And call them Kefes. They call them Kefes, we are the Middle Foundation. Okay. And that foundation was established by Chekmoni, and they are going to fund the foundation annually. So okay. I think they, when they started, about 100 million naira was given to them. But they, the basic intention of them is giving this money to the community. So our community will bring elected members to that board. Okay. I think this community is four four members, comprising 32 members. Out of the 32 members, they have a chairman that is going to manage the 100 million. So they will now sit down and do, okay, this year, this 100 million, what should we do this 100 million? We will now look at the community, the community one, two, three, we are going to this. Uh, we are going to do project for this community this year. Mm -hmm. Then the subsequent year, we are going to do project for that community. Mm -hmm. And now as how the management process up to now to date. Okay. To date. The current demands have been made because it's all of PIA. Yes, yes. Uh, I think uh, they managed it to 2000, 2016, okay. where Chevron showed one of the assets to one of their companies. Okay. First year, first year, exploration and production company. So they also came and uh, Chevron told them that this is the platform we are meeting with. Yes. Come and join the platform we are meeting. So at that point, when those two companies come together, Chevron was funding their own side. Then the first year, the two was funding their own side, own, own side from okay. eight communities. They basically, the idea is they strongly believe that if the commitments are in charge and the money are given to the committee, the rest, yes. they are going to do the project that the committee needed most. Okay. And that is a concept. Okay. Has there been peace? Was it peacefully and uh, frugally managed yes. among yes. the committee? To a large extent, there was peace. Okay. I know uh, a major factor yes. recently come to play. Okay. And some of the points, the process of generated a lot of reports. Yes. And some of them will become very wealthy in the process. We refuse to leave, uh, refuse to leave the system for others to operate. And it is a challenge system, but it's a very good system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baka, for you can sit down for sharing your experience uh, with us. Very do you have something to add? No, I don't have okay. I thank you for your eloquence. I know you are uh, you are seriously involved in this thing and you have that interest, which is a great one. Uh, okay, so GMOUs, not all companies did it because there was no mandate by law for a company to set up a GMOU. There was no law. The idea is that a corporate social responsibility is a moral obligation imposed upon companies. And in order to acquire what we refer to as a social license, let me be seeing my daughter Vicky move. Let me be seeing your black, black in your face. Sit down there. Good. Whenever I see you, I remember myself. Good girl. So, you need a social license to operate. President, are you with me? Now, you have got the legal license from the government in Abuja. That one is your own. 
The people also have to give you license. That license from the people for for the social world license. They can't take you to any court, but you need them to cooperate with you. You need their goodwill. You need peace so that your staff can operate well. Your staff can go into the community to buy themselves food to eat. They can relate well with the people. That social license can only come when you begin to implement corporate social responsibility and initiatives. Cottage hospitals, little roads, borehole. If there's a flood, you provide relief material, scholarships. Are you with me? Every community, every company is expected to do that. And so for a few companies, the approach they use was this GMO. Shell is also one of them. You know, Ajib did not. Shell and, uh, and the company just called Chevron, a number of them also went to the GMOU. Like I said, they set up a cluster board. And they can, and like for Shell, they, for normally four years. The board will operate for like four years and then we'll do a new election and all that. While Ajib did not do that, they still implemented it. several uh, host com uh, 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 CSRO initiatives also, particularly in the brass area. They give them a lot of employment give them a lot of small, small contract. So if you go to name, they go to brand, a lot of those people have connection with Ajib. Are you with me? Are you with me so far? Yes, Good people. But it was felt that as the PIA was coming on stream, we should move from CSRO initiatives to make it mandatory. Hence, the PIA now has now provided for the establishment of a, a host community development uh, and trust. And that is where we are today. We want to look at these sections 234 to 257. 234 to 257 provides for the establishment of a host community trust and the legal framework, the legal framework for managing it, administering it, funding it, and uh, all that. So we start with the, the the, uh, the objective, what is the objective of the trust itself? You see that in section 234, 234 of the Act, I will run through them. The objectives of chapter 3, one of them is to foster sustainable prosperity. You don't need to write, I'll send you my slide if you're interested. You're interested? Yes, sir. Okay, so number one is to foster sustainable prosperity. Two, to provide social and economic benefits for, for, from petroleum operations. Three, to advance peaceful and harmonious coexistence between concessionaires and their hosts. And four, to create a framework for the support of the development of host communities. So if I love you so much in the exam, I can set a straightforward question. What are the objectives of, the, uh, of chapter three? The host community trust, you should be able to just give me uh, that. And, uh, I may ask you how many clauses can you find in a production sharing contract. You should be able to tell me uh, and all that. So basically, the act provides set up a host community trust, and then uh, the, this is we want to now look at the framework. The interesting thing is that when we're talking about host community trust now, it's not just mandated to upstream companies. You can hear me talk about concessionaire. Set law. It's not just upstream, even the downstream or midstream company is now also mandated to set up a host community trust. So, Azikel Refinery that is operating in uh, his Bara area is also mandated to, uh, to set up a host community trust. Are you with me so far? Yes, Good. So, the obligation is incorporate this host, uh, section 235 basically needs to the obligations. Incorporate those community development trusts, which are what I call HC, HCDT, for the benefit of those communities for which these companies are now to be responsible. The company that establishes the trust is called the SET Law, S E W T L O R, S E W T L O R. And where there is a collectivity of SET laws operating under a JOA, four or five companies have a, a concession, a concession under a JV joint venture arrangement and they're operating under a JOA. It is the operator that will be uh, saddled with the responsibility to establish this trust and to manage it. Are you with me? Yes. Yes, yeah, so for example, we have Shell, NFPC and Ajib, they can have the JV, 
one company will be operated, operate it. That operator has this responsibility. And uh, another thing I want to point out at this level is that in setting up this trust, the act has removed again the onshore offshore dichotomy. I pointed it out. I still want to emphasize it because I'm asking you the exam. After the decision, following the decision of the Supreme Court in the case of Attorney General of the Federation of Attorney General of Abia and 35 others, what initiatives have been put forward to assuage the concerns of the Niger Delta people? You should be able to tell me first of all the 2004 Act that abolished onshore offshore dichotomy as far as 200 meter depth is concerned. 200 meter depth is concerned. And point out that that, that act did not go as far as the original provision in 1960 and 1963. 1960 and 1963 said anything you collect from the territorial sea, exclusive economic zone, continental shelf, contiguous zone, it is deemed to be a part of the eastern region or it was deemed to be a part of the eastern region, of course, of which Bayesa and, uh, and the river states and Akwai were a part of. But this 2004 Act only tried to capture the consents of some few states, one of which is Cross River, by saying that there will be no onshore offshore dichotomy for up to a 200 meter. Then another innovation in this regard is what we are now looking at. Session 235 is now providing that in in helping in developing those communities, we will not create that dichotomy. We will not recognize it. And so for those community issue, if the petroleum is collected from the exclusive economic zone, continental shelf, uh, I see wherever, the contiguous states to that zone, from that maritime zone where the petroleum is extracted, will be deemed to be part of that are you with me? We deem to be part of that exclusive economic zone or continental shelf for purpose only of them benefiting from this host community trust. Okay. Yeah, so for companies operating in shallow water and deep waters, the littoral communities and any other community determined by the set law are to be regarded as part of the host communities. Okay, let's move on. So now, what are the obligations? What did the Act say? The Act, first of all, now mandates the set law. The operator or the oil company in question, like I said, it could be an upstream concessionaire or downstream or midstream operator, but usually we'll be looking at uh, the focus definitely is upstream concessionaires. Are you with me? Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Then we could set, we could drop down a bit to uh, midstream operators as well. So first of all, appoint a board of trustees appoint a board of trust, that's the first thing they have to do, in consultation with the host communities. Because I told you that a concession that can be granted to one company can uh, straddle four or five communities. A concession can be very wide. Are you with me? Yes, sir. And so all those communities, like for example, my, where I come from now, Kayama, in fact my whole family, Subai family, we have oil in our land. But Upokuma, a neighboring community, are also part of what are you with me? So that concession covers the Pokuma, also covers the Kayama. So anything the, com the company is doing, they say they are giving contracts, so job they will, they will give uh, Pokuma one family. And it's not everybody of Pokuma, it could be a particular family. Are you with me? Are you with me? Yes. It could be Perez family, Owezi family, and Subai family in Kayama, it could be another family from Sampo. Would I have those lands? You all now come together and then uh, begin to dictate this. So first of all, appoint a board of trustees in consultation with host communities. And then this board of trustees will now approach the Corporate Affairs Commission, CAC, and incorporate the trust. So you are setting up a trust, and overseeing this trust will be a board of trustees. This board will now approach the Corporate Affairs Commission, and the Corporate Affairs Commission will now incorporate the association, the associ it will act what is actually incorporated, the trustees. So you say the incorporated trustees of uh, is, a, is a two host community development trust. Are you with me? Yes. yes, or the incorporated trustees, the registered trustees of Peremabri host community development trust, or Peremabri and the Kowe and maybe one other related community, host community development trust. 
everyone that is incorporated must end with the word post community development trust. That is what the law provides. Are you with me so far? Yes, sir. After you have done that, the next thing you want to do is to now, the company is now to do what they call a needs assessment. A needs assessment. What are the needs of these particular communities? Their problem here is water. We don't have a problem with water. Our own is flooding. We need to pile up our shores. Is that not so? Yes, so some communities that is their problem, empiling. Others is that they want to farm, but they need irrigation system. Whatever the problem is, you undertake a comprehensive needs assessment. Again, you can't do that without conferring with the people you want to help. That will be arrogance. So after you have done a lot of consultation and engagement, you will now set up and you will now know their needs. Then you will now draw up a plan, host community development plan. So first of all, you know the need. And then uh, the assessment will metamorpho metamorphose to a community development plan for the purpose of determining the projects to be undertaken by the trust. It makes sense, does it not? Yes. Sir. Yes. Now the trust, in order to ensure that we don't have unusual delay, must be set up within a defined time frame, section 236. Set up the trust within a defined time frame for existing OMLs. Existing OMLs. It must be set up within 12 months after the PIA is enacted, which, uh, which, we, use, uh, which we use the word effective date. Effective date. 12 months after the enactment of PIA, or what we call the effective date, set it up. For what we call designated fa facilities, these are mainly midstream operations. For designated facilities, set it up within 12 months after the effective date or the enactment of the PIA. What are designated facilities? Petroleum terminals crude oil and natural gas transportation pipelines, bulk storage farm, tank farms, refineries and gas processing plants, in midstream petroleum operations and petrochemical plants. So these are designated facilities. Are you with me so far? A company that has any of these facilities must also set up its trust within 12 months. For companies that are applying for the approval of their field development plans, field development plans, they must set up the trust before they even apply, before they even apply to the uh, upstream commission. You must set up the trust, that's what the law says, Section 236. For existing OPLs or PMLs or PPLs, set up the trust prior to making the application for a field development and plan. Can we continue, please? Now, let's say a few things. From time to time, we looked at uh, concessions that will be granted in uh, Chapter 2 of the Act, and we said that it's possible that a person may assign his concession with the minister's consent. Is that so? Yes, yes or novate it. Novation is basically an agreement, a, a renegotiation of an agreement that may totally change the face of that agreement that essentially looks like you have transferred it, or you may transfer your concession. In either of these cases, Either of these cases, if you're either novating, transferring, or assigning your concession, the man you're assigning it to, what you call the assignee or the transferee, is the one that will take over your obligation. So if I already have an host community obligation to use it too, and I'm now novating or transferring or assigning my concession to uh, Mr. Onos Nigeria Limited, he takes over my obligations. I'm free. Is that okay? Yes. But if I am surrendering my concession for surrender, if I'm surrendering my concession, you know, what is even between surrender and relinquishment, and uh, Alima? Okay. Relinquishment, uh, it's basically in the instance of a, when the concession is granted, like a PMS granted for a period of 20 years. At the end of the 10 year period, you have to relinquish half of your. Session back to the federal government and surrender is in the instance of okay, um, maybe you feel that you don't have enough hands and then you know that you cannot handle everything before it is forcefully relinquished from you that you have to give back that you then surrender it. Okay, you have an idea, thank you. But maybe put it better for her. Our black, our black and uh, hijab queen. 
Um, for refreshments, more or less, for an Thank you. You want to ask something? Okay, thank you very much. So please note the law of rel relinquishment. Uh, Alima, you said something. When you well move over to the, P P uh, the PIA regime, I pointed out that there's a, a slight distinction from the previous uh, provision. The previous provision is that after 10 years, you must relinquish half. Now, after 10 years, you must relinquish half of the concessions that are not uh, Producing. You must relinquish all part of your concession, not even half, all part of your concession area that is not uh, producing. And so I told us that the idea is to motivate you to develop your concession uh, and uh, take advantage of the time, not sleep on that. And we also pointed out that when a company decides to convert from OML to um, PML, you know, the law of conversion, one of the things is that you must be able to relinquish how many percentage? Excellent. You are my student. Anywhere you go, they tell you who teach the course. Call my name. <laughs> Did they hear me? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Call my name. Say, nah, I want to join my name. Nah, I'm so bad. If you don't know the course and they ask you who taught you, don't call my name. <laughs> say, it's one is German, but I've forgotten his name. He'd be black way where he used to wear glass. But I will remember his name <laughs> after. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Okay, so let's come back. Uh, but you're all trying. It's more small. Even me that is teaching, it's not once you get it, you keep developing. So, uh, you, you guys are trying. It's just I want it to be the best. I was talking with one of my students uh, two days ago. In fact, actually, she stayed in my house for one month, but I got. She was attending a, a program and uh, in a law firm, an internship arrangement. And she was telling me, you know, the company they into oil and gas. So the things she learned here, they were so helpful. You know, so I want you to really have a class. I was also talking with one of my daughters. She's a final year now, and she had something to do somewhere. And when she was opened her mouth to talk, oil and gas. Wow, <laughs> who taught you? <laughs> you can say it's better way. <laughs> it's better way, super. <laughs> you know, so please, you guys should try. Okay, so uh, we are back again. So for a company that surrenders, so surrender basically, I'm not doing it again. And the problem is too much. Hope your poor boys are seizing all my back. In fact, you can surrender for any reason. You don't need to give any reason. Notify the minister. But we told you that when you surrender, it is without prejudice to pre-existing obligations. Did we say that? Yes. Yeah, so the obligation for a company in this case is actually an annual obligation. I've set up a trust, and the law says every year conferred 3%. So if I surrender my concession to the federal government now, the federal government now say, okay, ah, you have surrendered, good, 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 let's give it to Vicky Nigeria Limited. And when they give it to her, my obligation for to that community is what is surviving. It precedes, it survives my surrender. My obligation to the community survives my surrender. So I don't come on hand for the concession, but the obligation I have to is the two community survives. But that survival is for just one year. Because definitely the next year will not be in operation. Is that not so? And the law says it is only the 3% of your spend for 2022. So if in 2022 I spent uh, 100 Naira to develop my concession, 3 Naira of that 100 Naira, I'm supposed to give to the two community. Now I'm to give it to them. I say, sorry, you have surrendered my concession to the government. That is without prejudice to that pre existing obligation. That's what we are saying. And uh, President, is it okay? Yes. Good. So, for surrender, the former concessionaire will continue to discharge the surviving obligation, notwithstanding that the area is surrendered 
the area that is surrendered may be granted to a new lease or licensee. For revocation, revocation, the government may say you are not complying with any of our laws. You know the law on revocation, section 95, section 96, we revoke or we terminate. Termination is that I am the one terminating. Is that not so? Or time, and time has expired. Either party can terminate and all that. So if there's revocation or termination or expiration, then the holder will also continue to discharge its surviving obligations, notwithstanding that the area revoked, terminated, or expired may also be granted to a new concessionaire. So I felt you should know that. And uh, now, uh, basically, and uh, so let's now look at the objectives of the trust. What is the objective of the trust that we are setting on? Number one is to finance and execute projects for the benefit of sustainable development or finance and execute projects for the sustainable development of that community. Two, for infrastructural development, the facilitation of economic empowerment opportunities, the advancement of, and propagation of educational development, healthcare support and the support of local initiatives aimed at enhancing environmental protection, and providing support for local initiatives which enhance security and assist in the development in developmental purposes that are beneficial to those communities and uh, okay so basically these are the objectives of the trust just to point out that the establishment of the trust fund will not necessarily disentitle those communities from any other entitlement under the law so you cannot say because you are benefiting from uh, and 3% host community. If we have a law called, we have a fund called the Ecological Fund. You are aware of that? Are you aware of that? Ecological Fund. So it's a fund where uh, I think states and federal governments are meant to be sending some amount of money to address environmental concerns. Uh, Edo states and some parts of uh, Ibo land have suffered a lot from erosion, wind erosion. If you go there, you see gullies. The Ecological Fund is meant to address those challenges. My mother's community, Agbere, is almost eating into two because of this uh, erosion. I don't know if any other person has experienced that in any other job community. Yeah. You have that too. So, in the community, when I was small, where I was small, the places we used to play when we were small now have now become part of the river. And so, and we may decide to use funds from the ecological fund to address that. You will not say, okay, because you are benefiting from those community, you will not partake of that. That is what section 239 basically is uh, saying. Okay, so let's say a few things about the trust. Uh, just a minute. Excuse me, sir. Yes, brother. How do we assess the ecological flow? You, go, you complain now. <laughs> you complain to the government. I don't even understand. I don't, know the, I don't know so much about it. Maybe you talk to my colleague. Uh, my colleagues teaching environmental law, but I want to believe that if there's a problem, there will be channels for complaints. Do you understand? Yes. And the board will not lose the way of money. But again, and when you go there and you go and find out that people are stealing, <laughs> stealing the money, everywhere people are stealing. <laughs> Just, I don't know what is wrong with us. Our values are so eroded. Everything we judge, everything we assess is from monetary perspective, and that is why we are where we are. This, this man is doing well. What is he doing well? He has money. I don't judge like that. You have all the money, you don't have values. I was talking with somebody yesterday. He was telling me of uh, his daughter has divorced. The husband has divorced. And the man was sleeping with the house girl. Your wife, or you have a wife, when she goes to work, you'll be sleeping with the house girl. Now the marriage is... He has money. Oh. And maybe she married him because of money. But now he's sleeping with the house girl. Eventually, the marriage has broken. So, no values. You know, so we need to come back. And God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh -huh. Let's come back again to host uh, community. Today, everybody wants to relocate to Canada. They are not going to Canada to improve the country. It's just to go there and make money. Nigerians go abroad. They don't go to do work that will better the lives of those people. When they go there, it's money. So they're involved in fraud, 419, yahoo yahoo, all those, eh? Drugs, is it not so? Bad things. Why? Because of values. But when you come back, you are celebrated not because of the value that
that you have added to community, you are celebrated because of the money you have. Okay. But I'm not part of it. I've never been. I'll never be. Okay, sorry. Uh, are there questions, Victory? Okay, so I've talked about new success. Uh, okay, yes, I've talked about objective. So now let's say something about the fund again. You know, so I, I just to see go back section 240. Set laws that to establish trust fund that to contribute an amount equal to 3% of the operating expenditure in the immediately preceding calendar year for the operations affecting the host community in question. The trust may also receive donations, gifts, or honoraria, as well as profits and interest accruing to the reserve fund to be established for the community. So essentially, the law says for what you did last year, like I said, you use 100 naira to operate all the expenses you made, the employees you employed, the equipment you bought, the uh, land matters you settled, the acquisition, all your expenditure, take 3% and commit it to that particular community or those groups of, those group, that group of communities or the group of communities affected by your operations. Are you with me? Of that 3% now, you have to divide it into three. There will be a capital fund so that capital fund will dedicate 70%. There will be a reserve fund where you dedicate 20%. That's making it 90. Is that 90? Yes. Yes. Just a second. 70 or 75? Yes. Okay, sorry, not 70, 75. Yeah, so dedicate 75 percent to a capital fund number two 20 percent to a reserve fund that one is more like you are saving it you give what they call a fund manager Alima, are you with me yes sir you give a fund manager or oh, got this money look for where you can invest it a, a hedge fund or a very very solid investment system where we are sure 100 percent sure <laughs> of returns don't use and gamble so they are what they call investments and platforms where a company can invest. Your profit will not be too much, but your risk is next to zero, one of which is government bonds. The idea is that a government cannot go bankrupt. So if a government borrows from you, they will pay, but what they will pay may not be much. Then you now have riskier ventures. You don't carry this kind of money that belongs to a group of people and then invest it in a... You don't carry this kind of money. Please give room for it. My daughter Coco. How is your body now? Okay. Can you fight as you are like this? <laughs> you cannot fight yet. Okay. I used to have one church member. Her stomach is big like this. I never see big like this. Pregnant. We used to feel for her. One day after church I was going, I got to Philly Station to buy food. I saw her almost fighting. With her big stomach. Oh. The filling station attendant tried to beat the woman. The woman was running, she was pushing the woman. I know she was telling the woman, we didn't sniff not for this condition, what I would do to you. And I was like, if with this condition, you want to kill the woman, what if you are not pregnant? <laughs> and she saw me, and she was so ashamed. She was so ashamed because she never knew I would come there. Let's come back. Coco, sorry about that, but yeah, you are not feeling well. You have. Thursday, tell all those people that did not come to do their test. I will give them another. Thursday is the last. For that very day, I'm submitting it into a book. If you like this, uh -huh. there your hand. What of the other girl? Eh? She has she has not been coming. I didn't see her. I didn't hear from her. Talk to me. Hmm? Is it talk to me? Eh? I didn't hear from her. I didn't see her. I did not tell Ken to tell Ken. Whether he said the wife is sick, so I will give him another chance Thursday. Nothing after that. Have I not tried? Let's come back. So 20% in a reserve fund, like I said, it must be a very solid investment. And then 5% for administrative costs. The reason why the law provided it like that is that if it wasn't provided like that, you hear that they use 
80% of the fund for administrative uh, expenditure. Is that not what we love about? Yes. And so we are now saying 70% must be used for capital projects. Administrative operations, only 5%. And it mustn't be 5%. So not more than 5% of administrative costs or special projects, etc. Although at the end of each financial year, so for that 5%, if at the end of the financial year, you only use 2% for administrative costs, the main 3% put it back to uh, the capital fund for the next year. Are there questions? Are there questions? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, please. I think... Uh, the, those committee development trust, composition of the board of trustees. Yes. The law talk about integrity. Yeah, we'll come to the board. Just okay. waste more. Glory to God. Okay. So the Board of Trustees under Section 245 is to provide a matrix for distribution of the fund to the host community. That one is a big word, matrix. Matrix basically is a procedure, a strategy. I told you we could have three communities, four. How do you now say uh, there are four communities under this trust fund and we have 100 million? This year we can say we are giving 50 million to Kayama because almost all of our production was from Kayama. We just took small from uh, Okokuma and took small from uh, Sambo. There must be a, a strategy, identifiable and objectable, objective strategy that the Board of Trustees must uh, provide, I mean must use. It is the set of the company, the company is to provide to the Board of Trustees a matrix for the distribution of funds to these communities and that is what the Board will now use to uh, determine how they will share the funds. Okay, let's continue. Let's make some progress before we... So now let's look at the management structure, management matters basically. Let's look at the management structure of this host community fund. So there are basically four, four basic frameworks. My daughter Coco, we are looking at the legal framework for host communities. Are you hearing? Good. Is the AC too much for you? Are you sure? Good. Okay, we are looking at uh, four basic structures. First of all, we have the set law or the company that establishes the trust. And then we now have the board of trustees. We we'll step down a bit to now have what they call a management committee. Step down a bit to now have the advisory committee. I'll take it again. At the apex, we we'll have the set law, the company. We we'll step down a bit to we'll have the board of trustees. Come down a bit to we'll have the management committee. And come down to the various to we'll have the uh, advisory. Yes, advisory committee. So the set law is the company. I don't need to say much about that. But when we now come to the board of trustees, the law also tells us, section 242, it is the company that sets up this board. They are the ones that will choose who will be in the board. So it's set up by, or established by the settlers who also determines the membership of the board and the criteria for the appointment, subject to the approval of the regulator, the commission or the authority as the case may be. The board, section 242, is to be manned by persons of high, not integrity, high integrity <laughs> and professional standing. So two things, you must have competence, professional standing, you must have honesty, integrity. So these are the two strands upon which you are to be on that committee. Because you can have a good head and a very rotten heart. You can have a very good heart and a very bad head. It means you have honesty and integrity, but there's nothing up here. Buari, for example, is not a corrupt man, I'll say it forever. <laughs> but he doesn't, know, he doesn't know what he's doing. He did not know what he was doing. He did not know what he was doing. So on a large scale, you could say Buari is largely an honest man, but no capacity. 
Okay, so another thing I want to point out is that the members of this board may be drawn from the community or from anywhere. You can go to UK and bring members of the board. Don't, they don't have to be members of those communities. That is nothing. Uh, and you need to know. And the set law will determine the procedure for selecting the members of the board, will determine their meetings, will institute uh, or impose financial regulations on them, and will also determine their administrative procedure. Board members that operate for four years, they will be elected for another four years, maximum of eight. Are you with me? And they will be supported by a secretary. Basically, the secretary will advise them on compliance and will keep their, manage their books and all that. What is the role of the board, section 243? Determine the criteria, process, and proportion. So basically, let me just look up at me. For every basic corporate entity, we usually have a, a board, a board. And that board will comprise largely of non-executives and executives. The non-executives are people who are expected to come and bring to bear uh, experience, oversight, balance, and integrity. These are non-executives. They don't draw salary. They are not paid salary. So it's largely a thankless job. The highest thing they can benefit from is uh, sitting allowances, transport allowance. Are you with me so far? Are you with me so far? They are not staff. They are not employees. The board may meet just twice or thrice in the year. They can meet at the beginning of the year, look at the budget of the entity, and approve the budget. Draw, and what they do is to give general oversight and policy formulation. But when we come to the functional day-to-day -day management, we we'll have what they call executives. Are you with me so far? Executives are employees. They go to work every day. They are top management staff. In some instances, they will sit on the board. If an executive sits on the board, we call him an executive director. If he doesn't sit on the board, he's a top executive, but he's not a board member. Are you with me so far? Yes. That same concept is brought here, and it brought, you see it in virtually every corporate setting. A good example is Niger Delta University, which is a corporation. And for Niger Delta University, we have the council. Then we have the management staff. Management staff, I talk about the vice chancellor, and then and the registrar, deputy uh, uh, vice chancellor admin, deputy vice chancellor academics, and maybe the library staff, li librarian, those are management staff. Then you now have the council. Council for India you meet like twice a year. So we have one meeting coming up in December. We had the last one in uh, March. We meet it twice or twice a year, council members. So the council is synonymous or similar to a board. Are you with me? Are you with me? Yes, yes. No. So that concept is brought here. So what does the board do? Like I said, that means the criteria, process, and, and proportion of the fund to be allotted to specific development programs, approve projects for which the fund is to be utilized, provide general oversight of projects, approve the appointment of persons or companies that are to manage the reserve fund, set up the management committees for the trust, and then determine the allocation of funds based on the metrics already provided to them by the set law. Now let's say a few things about the management committee. I said these are basically staff. These are basically people who go to work on a daily basis, you know, and then, and you know, even for a corporate entity, like I said, you may have different layers of management. So for example, in Nigeria Delta University now, the deans of the faculties are all uh, management staff, but they're not in the top management layer, the top management layer, uh, like I said, the VC, and then the uh, those other people like us. Are you with me? Are you with me? Yes, sir. Step down a bit, you now have the deans of faculties and directors. Step down a bit, you now have heads of departments. So even a head, a head of department is a management staff to some extent. You know, so section 247 provides that there should be a management committee for every trust. Is to be is to comprise in this instance of representatives of those communities. Is to comprise of the management committee. Is to comprise of host communities, representative of host communities, and then executives. So here, yeah, the management committee has a mixture again of non-executives and then executives. Are you with me so far? So not all of them are actually employees in this case. Not all of them are day-to-day -day staff. 
So every host community represented will have one or two members in the management committee. They will have executive members who are again to be people of high integrity and professional standing. And again, they need not come from the host communities appointed again for four years and they will be supported and by a secretary and all that. The Board of Trustees is also mandated. So the set law sets up the Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees sets up the management committee. They oversee that process. And so the Board of Trustees will determine the selection process, procedure for meetings, financial regulation, administration procedure, and all that, the remuneration, discipline, qualification, disqualification, suspension, and removal of members of the management committee, and any other matter basically related to them. What are their duties? They prepare the budget. I told you the board approves the budget, but the management committee will prepare the budget and submit it to them for approval. Are you with me so far? They will develop and manage the contracting process for project awards on behalf of the host community development trust. Again, subject to the approval of the board. They will determine project award winners and contractors to execute projects on behalf of the host community development and trust through a transparent process subject to the approval again of the board. They will supervise the project's execution. They will supervise project's execution. They will nominate fund managers. We'll talk about that. They will nominate fund managers for appointment by the Board of Trustees. So the Board of Trustees appoint the fund managers. Recently, the Nigeria Auditory Regulatory Commission, tomorrow, tomorrow we'll meet on Thursday, we'll talk about what has happened since this act. Is that OK? Is that OK? Yes. So, so today I'm giving you, this is what the act is doing. On Thursday, we'll look at what has happened since. So they will nominate fund managers for the appointment of the board, uh, for appointment by the Board of Trustees, for approval to manage the reserve uh, fund. They will report on the activities of the uh, management committee, contractors and other service providers to the Board of Trustees and undertake any other function and duty that may be assigned to them by the Board of Trustees to enable the performance of the uh, trust. Thank you, Lord. Okay, now we'll now talk about the advisory committee. Similar system, but here what they do is to advise. Are you with me? And here we're basically looking at people from these communities. So the constitution of the HC, HCPT shall mandate the management committee to require each host community to set up and host community advisory committee. Perhaps I should draw back a bit. When you are setting up, when you are incorporating this entity with the Corporate Affairs Commission, the trust, there must be a rule, a document that will regulate the operation. That, that document is called the Constitution. If it's a company, it will have, will have called it the Memorandum and Articles of Association. But for this entity that is registered, normally uh, that should be part, part D or C, part F or so of the Company of Life Matters Act. Call that document regulating the internal working of the Constitution. And Section 249 is telling us that the Constitution is to mandate the management committee to require each host community to set up this advisory committee. Again, the management committee will now determine the selection process, procedure for meeting financial regulation, administrative procedures, remuneration discipline, just like just like was done for it by the board. The management committee is now doing the same for the uh, advisory committee. Is that okay? Yes, and the decision of the management committee, again, shall be subjected to the board for approval. What are their functions? They are, what do they do with the advisory committee? They will nominate members to represent those communities on the management uh, committee. They articulate community development projects to be transmitted to the management committee. They monitor and, regret and report the progress of pro projects being executed in the community to the management committee. They advise the committee on activities that may lead to the improvement of security of infrastructure, enhancement of peace building within the community and the entire area of operation. So basically, they advise, they suggest. Uh, now well, we be on ground, now we know our people, this is what you will do and there will be peace. Are you with me so far? Yes, yes. yes this is, so they advise, you have to listen to them. To fail to do so is arrogance on your part. So section 200, 
and uh, fifth. And anybody who does not listen is a fool. One of the greatest benefits I have in my life is I listen. I listen to my children, I listen to my students, I listen to my wife, I listen to my pastor, I listen. If you cannot listen, nobody can talk to you, you are a fool. <laughs> you should not marry, <laughs> because you crash your wife and your children into a ditch. You, you will not end well. You will make wrong mistakes in life. You should listen. May God help us in Jesus' name. Amen. You are a married woman to listen. People should be able to advise you, people older than you, people that know your parents, your children. Your friends, listen. I have this friend, he said he wanted to resign his job. Good job in Scotland. He wants to go into full time preaching. I said, Have you talked to your pastors in Scotland, the church you are going to? Have they given you, have you shared your vision with them? He said, He will not. He just caught the phone off. He will not do what we are doing in Nigeria, blah, blah, blah. He went to resign. For 18 months, he suffered. He suffered. No food to eat in the UK. <laughs> After much hunger, he now went back to do what I was advising him to do. Now he's in Qatar, doing very well. Okay, let's come back. Those community needs assessment. I've already said that before. That even before you set up your plan, you must do a needs and what assessment. Section two hundred fifty one. Set laws are required to conduct a needs assessment for the host communities from a social environmental and economic perspective that to determine the specific needs of each affected community and to ascertain the effect that the proposed uh, uh, operations or projects might have on it and to provide a strategy for it. So basically, needs assessment, you know what that is. And I told you after that, uh, you now have a plan. In drawing that needs assessment, section 251 says, you you must show that you engage with the people. You must show that you engage with the affected those community to understand the issues and needs of each community, number one. Two, you consulted with and you considered the reasonable concerns of women, youth, and community leaders. Why are we saying this? We want your, your approach to be all embracing. Is that not so? You consult with the major stakeholders in the community. The women are, are, they constitute a group. Their concerns will be different from that of the youth. And then you also consider the community leader. And large, lastly, you must show that you engage with each affected host community in developing a strategy to address the needs and effects identified in each uh, community as the case may be. And I told you after that, you have to draw up a plan. What is the plan to be about? Let me just run through again, section 251 to 52. The plan must be based on the metrics provided for the metrics, not talking about metrics, I'm talking about the metrics for division of the money, section 245. It must specify the community development initiatives required to respond to the findings and strategy identified in the host community needs assessment. It must determine and specify the projects to implement the specified initiatives. It must provide a detailed timeline for projects. It must determine and prepare the budget of the host community development plan and set out and set out the reasons and objectives of each project as supported by the host community needs uh, assessment. Okay. Okay, so basically, basically, basically that is that. And uh, take your time again and look at it. Now let's, we're almost done. We just have nine minutes. You have another class, don't you? Lecture is not coming. Okay, but I have something to do. So let's run through taxation and financial matters. Taxation and financial matters. Definitely, if we are setting up this kind of entity and uh, we'll be committing millions, because this 3%, for an oil company can run into millions or billions of naira. Are you with me? Yes. So if we are going to give you billions of naira to develop your community, we also want to have uh, some form of accounting from you. We want to have some form, some form of accounting. Every layer must provide accounting. This sets law. The company must account to the regulator. The board of trustees must account to the Sets law. I mean, yes, there is set law. The management committee must account to the uh, board of trustees, you know, and all that. So you have to provide 
basically audit, audited statements, account, your accounts must be audited basically, and in some instances you have to provide annual reports. The annual report is a generalized report of all we did. Then we now have a specific financial uh, and document which is called the accounting financial statements, which must have been uh, audited and all that. So I'll run through what we have here. The financial year of, first of all, the financial year of the post community development trust will commence on the first day of January and end on the 31st day of December, 31st of December of each year, or any other day set for that purpose by the Board of Trustees. So the Board of Trustees can choose any other year, any other day. If they don't, by default, they will be looking at January 1st to 31st of December. That is your uh, financial year. Number two, the constitution of the trust shall also contain provisions requiring the board to keep account of the financial activities of the trust, two, to appoint auditors to audit the accounts of the trust annually, and and just sorry, let me just say, not getting this line, section 254, just a second. Yes, and they also appoint auditors, they must also appoint auditors to audit the accounts of the host communities annually as well. Good. So you see that in section 253254. The funds of the trust are non, you don't tax them, they're a non-profit organization, you know that. Yes, so you don't tax them, section 256. And payments made by settlers are deductible for tax purposes, section 257. So that 3%, that 3% that the settler pays to the host community trust, when they want to pay tax to the government at the end of the tax same period or whatever, they are allowed to make some deductions of their expenses. This money is one of the money they are allowed to deduct. No, now you have made profit of. Yeah, you sold uh, 100 naira. Government say of this 100 naira, 30 percent belongs to government as tax. But before you arrive at your profits, you have what they call gross profits. All I sold this year is 100 naira. They have what they call net profits. Before you pay the 100 naira, you are allowed to now deduct your expenses. You understand? I hire uh, accommodation for 20 naira. Eh? Operating cost. Yeah, operating cost. I pay my staff 15 naira. I do this, I do this. I pay 3%. So I pay 3 naira to host community. You deduct all that. After you have finished all the deductions, what you had as gross was 100. What you may now have as net will be 40. It's from this 40 naira now that government will now take 30%. If you don't do your deductions properly, or you don't keep your, 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 your receipts, all those receipts as you are making those payments, anything you tell government, government will say you are lying now. No be so. Yes, so. Vicky, is it clear? Good. So they are exempted from tax, and payments made by set laws are deductible for tax. Yeah. Proposes. I'm almost done. Okay, so accounts and reports section 255. Please look it up, look it up. I've already said a few things about it. So, uh, the management committee submits a uh, uh, media report, and then media reports should not be more than 31st of August. So, you submit two reports. Management committee will submit two reports. First, the media reports and then uh, a, an annual report, media report, annual report, so two reports. For the media report, not, not later than 31st of August. For the annual report, not later than 28th of February of the next uh, year. The Board of Trustees is on its own now to submit an annual report accompanied with an uh, uh, audited account to the set law, not later than 31st of March. So the, uh, uh, the management committee will submit their report, like I said, to the Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees will carry it and prepare their own report that they will submit to the set law. 
not later than the 31st of March. And he said, Law will now, in return, submit another report as well as the statements to the Commission Authority as the case may be, not later than May of the particular year. Just in conclusion, there's what they call a sabotage, and this is one of the challenges some people have with this provision. They said, Section 257, of that 3% were to give you, if your youths, you don't hold your roots, you are not able to rein your people, they go and damage our pipeline, there was community disturbance, they destroyed our um, flow station, and after all this de destruction, we now come and repair, we do clean up, we compensate, and all the expenses we made, we're to give 100 million, but by the time we did all this expense, <laughs> expenditure, we have now spent 90 million, it's only 10 million we'll give you, so it's a, it's a caution to the host communities to rein in their dogs, attack dogs. The truth is that, 90, according to them, 97% of the spinaches occurring in the Niger Delta is due to sabotage. If that is true, then that is very bad. Is it true? Yes. Yes, that is bad. I was presenting, and I, last week I told you I was not going to go out because I was doing a presentation. I was doing a training for NMPC staff in Port Harcourt, and they were giving me some, some information that was mind-boggling, you know, about things. But they were, they were coming from a legal perspective, but they were also giving me industry perspective, <laughs> just like Abaka is giving me host community perspective. And then one of them was telling me an experience here just two weeks ago, where they went to repair some facilities somewhere at the home. And the whole village ganged up, you know, attacking them, doing a lot of terrible things. We, are, we have to advise ourselves, we are not living in a barbaric age. People come to also work in your community and uh, they want to do a contract for you. They want to build you. You say they should first pay you. Come in. Yes, 12.30, sir. Okay. And they should first pay you before they should repair you. Meanwhile, they say when they go to North, contractors, when they go to North and they are working, the communities will be bringing food because you are doing road for them. They will bring two, who knows two? Two? Grass. grass. Two is it grass? Yes, two is grass. Two is not grass. Yes. yes. Huh? You know it now. Okay, you don't know two. Two is a food, like food and corn, food. rice. Rice or corn or something. Right, very nice food. So as you are walking in the north, these people will bring it for the contractors, who will bring food, they make them, they are happy, the chief will come. When you come to Niger Delta, on the other hand, or maybe Eastern Nigeria, the reverse is the case. You see hostility, you see violence, it's tough not to be. We have to talk, this is not our job we used to do in the past. We have to talk to ourselves. I'm talking to you now, community people. <laughs> Go we'll take this message back to our people. Oh. Eh? Our people. Our people are bad now. Mostly <laughs> the traditional rulers. You start from them. Mm. That is problem. It's well. Ziki, you take it to Sabama. <laughs> Koko, take it to Barai. My daughter, take it to Ondo. I think there's oil in Ondo. President, yes. take it to Ekenu. I have no oil in my state. Which state is that? Take it to Well, oil will come. <laughs> take it to uh, Delta. We have to change. So, where in any year an act of vandalism, sabotage, or other civil arrest or cause that causes damage to petroleum and designated facilities or disrupts production activities within the host community, the community shall forfeit its entitlement to the extent of the cost of repairs of the damage that resulted from the activity with respect to the provisions of this act within that financial year. The basis for computation of the trust fund in any year shall always exclude the cost of repairs of damaged facilities attributable to any act of vandalism, sabotage, or other civil unrest. That is section 259. That's a serious one. Some people have criticized it that uh, is the government imposing upon the communities the obligation to secure facilities. That is not our duty. I and mean, in my village, we came and put pipeline you are taking my oil. The law has provided that you should give me small thing. Why will you not impose an obligation on me to secure 
your pipeline. That is the role of security agencies. I'm not trained to do that. And if a few miscreants, because there's no way you don't have bad people. So if a few miscreants now go and damage the pipeline, why should the rest of the community suffer? And that is a logical uh, argument. But the other argument is also logical. Because whether we like it or not, you will suffer for what your people are doing. So it's your own duty to also rein in your people. Look at what Gaza is going through. Majority of them are peaceful. A few people entered into Israel and killed people. Now everybody suffers. And most times when you suffer, you suffer disproportionately. What they are suffering now is disproportionate. But they say 8,000 people have died. The people they killed, uh, they killed uh, 1,400. 8,000 people are, are still running, you know, the numbers are counting. So whether we like it or not, uh, the law is saying to us, you cannot be separated from your people. So if you have, eh, take responsibility. you must take responsibility. You have town hall meetings, you have youths. You have to be able to have regular discussion and change the orientation. This is what we are expecting of scholarship of all of our one go school, women, cottage hospital, this one, that one. If our youths now decide to go and damage pipeline, to go and do civil arrest, seize a woman, do all those bastard things they are doing, all of us will suffer. That is what the law is saying for now. Okay, so. Just in conclusion, if a company refuses to comply with its own community obligation, it's a ground for revocation. We looked at it in section 95, 96, and section 238 is also emphasizing it as well. Okay, so positives. Let me just run through positives and issues, and after that we are done. What are the positives? We have localized development. Development of those communities is no longer left with Timmy Prisiva or Doye Diri or Seyake Dixon, he's no longer left at the realm of the governor and his caprices and whims. We have now localized development. Are you with me? We have bypassed the governor, we have bypassed the House of Assembly, and we're seeing from the oil company directly to the community, and I think that's a good one. Number two, funds are tied to expenditure and not profit. That's another good one. Funds are tied, the payment. We are not saying give us 3% of your profit. You spent 1 million, 100 million naira last year as your expenditure from their compensators. Don't say, okay, I spend all that money now, but I don't profit now. I don't even understand. It's not tied to profit. I don't profit now after I spend all that money. In fact, I even lost. So nothing for you. No, 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 no. As you are spending that 100 million last year in the two, keep 3% of that 100 million aside. Number two, it has improved on the GMOU model. There were a lot of issues with GMOU issues. GMOU, a lot of issues that have been involved. Even my PhD thesis, I talked about it, lack of transparency, unenforceability. In some instances, we do not even know the criteria the oil companies were using. There were community issues and all that. This one is a bit better because the regulator is involved. Everything is transparent. It will go a long way to address in addressing the developmental challenges of the region, it, it has a positive a possibility of improving oil company community relationship, and there is now dispute uh, dispute resolution mechanism. I'll talk about it briefly. Dispute mechanism resolution is now also provided. So instead of everything will go to court, there are now uh, it's now possibility. The issues. What are the issues? The, the concerns we have. How do we determine a host community? We we'll look at it all come on Thursday. Is that okay? Yes. Number one issue: How do we determine the host community? Number two: Three percent is it enough? The question is: How much is enough? Three <laughs> percent is it enough? And then the question we ask ourselves: How much is enough? Number three: The issue of vandalism is the act penalizing host communities for vandalism and sabotage. Fourth question: People have argued that the power of the state law is too much. And so the question we're asking, should an independent authority, rather than the set law, oversee the trust? Are the powers of the set law too much? So those are issues I want you to go and then uh, look into. Come here. 
Oh, thank you for strength. There's something I want to just add before I release you. The regulatory authorities, yes, I did say that. The role of regulatory authorities in this whole business, what is their role? Okay, so let's leave it. When we meet on a Thursday, I will start by looking at the role of the regulatory authorities. I will now look at what has happened there. No, let me just take it, just one slide. First of all, section 234, and the regulatory authority, the authority of the commission as the case may be, are mandated to make regulations to guide the development of the trust. And these regulations will, among other things, provide for a grievance remedial mechanism aimed at resolving disputes between state laws and their hosts. Have they done that? We'll look at it on Thursday. The regulations may also authorize the state laws to make adjustments aimed at reducing expenditure where the available funds for the administration of the trust as provided under the section is insufficient to fund ongoing operation. In that regard, for example, so what we are saying here is that the, the, the authorities, upstream or downstream or mission the case maybe, will now make regulations, one of which is they may empower the state law to initiate uh, measures designed to reduce operational expenditure. So for example, a state law may reduce the number of members of the board of trustees uh, too much, total of 50, in view of our financial challenges, we are reducing it to five. And they used to meet four times every year. And these four times now we rent to there for them. No be so. Transport allowance. This one. Buffet. Blah blah blah. And they used to meet four times. We have reduced meetings to twice. So those are all measures that the set laws uh, may be able to initiate. The same with management committee, the same with advisory committee. We can reduce meetings, we can reduce uh, numbers. And uh, all the regulators are also required to make reg regulations to guide and safeguard the utilization of the funds. To guide, and to, of course, we, when we say to guide and safeguard, is with respect to what fraud. The challenge with our country is that with all the initiatives designed to guard and safeguard fraud, still occurs because they said uh, banks are not meant to. If anybody wants to transfer more than five million, they must notify EFCC. No be so they talk. If you are depositing more than one million, that should be a check. Those rules only apply for me and you. Recently, I opened a, 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 a corporate account. They are warning me that I should bring one document called SCUMO. I don't bring it to close my account. I should go and get it from EFCC. I said, if you people are worrying me, you are worrying all the criminals the way you are worrying me, we will not have theft <laughs> <laughs> in this country. You know, but the idea is the set laws are to put in place measures to guide and then safeguard. And the regulators are to have oversight responsibility to ensure that projects proposed by the Board of Trustees are implemented. I take one question and we are done. Okay. So I see you on Thursday, 10 o'clock. I love you all. Hey, on this subject, hey. on this topic, yeah, related. That is based on the. Come, let the camera catch your face. So yeah, based on the first area that I started talking about the, the ocean and also the dichotomy. Yes. In the case of the uh, AG Federation, based on AG Abias data. Thirty-five dollars. Yes. About the decision of the Supreme Court. Yes. Yeah, that table. That is the decision of the, the federal government. And yes. So as what are the policies of the federal government? Yes. To assist the oil producing states after the decision of the court. Is it not what I already said? One is that the federal government immediately initiated the amendment of or the introduction of onshore-offshore dichotomy. That is what I said, 2004. Two, the set of the Niger Delta Ministry. In 19, uh, 2001, they had enacted a law called the NDDC Act. Is that not so? Yes. Setting up a Niger Delta Development Commission to help us. So these are measures. And now we now have those community development systems. 
As soon as this act has been implemented, mm. it was signed to law. Yes. You know, the same group of persons have been interested. And I think some of them are nominated for the BOTs. Wow. So we think that if that large amount of money is coming to the community, most of us will be enslaved. Mm. We will be enslaved. Let us continue no, to hope. Major to us as well. Let us continue to hope for the best. <laughs> thank you, sir. And uh, thank you for that perspective. Any any observations, President? How was this class? Was it beneficial? Yes, sir. Did you learn any new thing? Yes, sir. Good. So we call it a day. Thank you, sir. Love you all. Sir. Yes, brother. Can you can I have a slide on my Why not?